Good morning, church. I hope you enjoyed uh, praise and worship this morning. Uh, I invite you to go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And today we're going to be looking at one verse, and that's verse 4. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 4. I also ask that you take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 4, the fourth chapter in the book of Genesis. And there we're going to find the majority of our supporting verses for today's lesson. Uh, now, if you're not aware of it uh, by now, uh, last week we officially launched our new church app uh, entitled Hope to You. And that is available whether you've got an iPhone or an Android device. If you have an iPhone, you can go to the Apple Store and just type in Hope, uh, the number 2, and the word you, and it should pull up. If you've got an Android device, uh, just go to the Google Play Store and you have to just type hope to you, no spaces, and our app should uh, pull up. You should be able to download it and uh, be able to use it. It's free of charge, and on that app you'll find a variety of things. You'll find uh, devotions, you'll find sermons, you'll find information on the church, what we believe. Uh, you'll also uh, find that you'll have an online giving option, among other things. And I'm so excited and proud of what we are able to offer to anyone and everyone uh, through this app. And I just want to take the time to get a sh give a shout out to three special ladies uh, that made this app a reality. And that is Jennifer Sumner, uh, Patricia Hill, and Jordan Thompson. Those are the ones who are responsible uh, for bringing all this to fruition. They've been working behind the scenes for the last four months tirelessly. And I just want to encourage you, church, if you have the opportunity, just to thank them uh, for the countless hours and the work that they've put in uh, to this app. I am just so proud uh, of what we have uh, there through uh, this technology at our disposal. And just as a side note, we're also in the process of redesigning our website. And the new work website will work in conjunction uh, with our app. Hopefully it'll work seamlessly. Uh, but just be on the lookout for that here over the coming days as well. Now, if you were with us last week, you know that we are now in the 11th chapter here in the book of Hebrews, which is known as the great faith chapter of the Bible. And this chapter began by defining what biblical faith is. And we learned that true faith is more than just believing. Uh, the Bible says the demons believe yet they don't have saving faith. In fact, we learned last week that faith actually consists of three components. Faith is committed to living a life for God. It is convinced and convicted of unseen realities. And it comprehends the authority of God's Word. That is faith as defined by the Bible. It is committed, convinced, and it comprehends the authority of God's Word. And if you were unable to be with us last week, I want to encourage you to go to our app or go to uh, the YouTube page and listen to that sermon because it is absolutely essential that you understand what God approves of when it comes to faith. Now today the Holy Spirit brings us to the first act of faith as recorded in the Scriptures. And that is the faith of Abel. And what we have within this verse is so important that we're going to look very carefully at this single verse here this morning. We're going to see that faith offers the appropriate sacrifice and in return that individual is approved and accepted by God. Look at what we're told here in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. We're told by faith... Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet he speaks. Now, in order to better understand this verse and what the Lord would have us to see this morning, I think it's important to revisit the account of Cain and Abel here in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, just flip over to Genesis chapter 4 this morning. Now I know most of you are familiar with this account, but look at it with me once again this morning, beginning in verse 1. 
we're told, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bore his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought an offering from the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, the Lord had no respect. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do us not well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Now, as we all know, after the fall, God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden. And sometime after that, they came together as husband and wife. We're told here that Adam knew his wife Eve. And they had two sons. The firstborn's name was Cain, followed by his brother Abel. And the Bible says here that Abel was the keeper of the sheep, while Cain was a tiller of the ground. In effect, Abel was a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer. And we're told that in the process of time, When these two boys reached the age of accountability, God sought an offering. And we're told that Cain brought the Lord an offering that consisted of fruit from the ground. He brought the Lord a vegetable offering, a fruit offering. And Abel brought a lamb, one of the firstborn from his flock. And we're told something very interesting here in Genesis. We're told that the Lord had respect for Abel and his offering, But he didn't have respect for Cain and what he had offered. Now, why was that? Why was that? I mean, on the surface, everything seems to make sense. Abel was a shepherd, so he brought the Lord one of the finest sheep from his flock. And as a farmer, Cain brought the Lord some fruit that he had raised from the ground. Yet the Lord didn't accept Cain's offering. Is this the Lord showing favoritism very early on in the history of mankind? Did the the Lord like Abel more than Cain? Or maybe the Lord's like me and he just prefers meat over vegetables. Well, it's none of these things. We're told here in our text this morning, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Abel's offering was superior, we're told. It was more excellent and ultimately acceptable to God simply because it was a blood sacrifice. See, that is the only offering, the only sacrifice that is acceptable to God. It's all about the blood. See, here the issue at hand in Genesis chapter 4 is the issue at hand throughout all the Bible. It's the issue at hand throughout all of history of man's history. And that's sin. As we know, Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden. And as a result, the disease of sin entered into the world. Sin contaminated the world. And not only did sin contaminate the world, but it contaminated Adam and Eve. It contaminated their blood. And because sin was in their bloodstream, when they came together as husband and wife, it was passed down to their children. It was passed down to Cain and Abel. We're told in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, speaking of Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed unto all men, for all have sinned. The disease of sin passed down from generation to generation because of Adam's decision in the garden. When Adam fell, his children fell. We all fail because we're all related to Adam by blood. The blood that is running through your veins is Adam's blood. And here in Genesis chapter 4, God is addressing the sin problem that had been passed down to Cain and Abel. And he asked for a blood sacrifice in order for their sin to be forgiven. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, Without the shedding of blood, there is 
no forgiveness of sin. It's all about the blood. In order for sin to be covered, in order for God's judgment to pass over you, and in order for you to be completely forgiven, blood must be shed. That's never changed. There's no escaping that truth from Genesis to Revelation. That has always been the requirement of of, of, of God. He has always required a blood sacrifice. And on page after page of the Bible, we see that truth. Think about Adam and Eve for a second this morning. After they chose to disobey God, the Bible says their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. They knew that they had sinned. So in an attempt to cover that sin, they sewed fig leaves together and draped it over their bodies. And that's what many of you are attempting to do this morning. You're attempting to cover yourself by sowing fig leaves and and covering your sin, trying to hide from God. But it doesn't work. And it didn't work for Adam and Eve. God saw through it. Their sin was still staring him in the face. So the Bible says the Lord made coats from animal hides and clothed them. Now think about that. Adam and Eve lived in paradise. Everything was perfect. Everything was in perfect harmony. They had never seen anything killed. What must their reaction have been when the blood of innocent animals was spilled? What must their reaction have been as as God is skinning these innocent animals in order to cover their sin and nakedness? The horror that must have been on their face when God had to shed that innocent blood. It takes the shedding of blood to cover our sins. It takes the shedding of blood this morning to escape God's judgment. Think about the the, the Jewish families in Egypt at the Passover. Pharaoh had defied God over and over again, refusing to let his people go. So God issued his judgment. He said that he would pass through the land and the firstborn child of every family would die, and that included Pharaoh's firstborn. And God told told Moses that in order to escape the coming judgment, blood had to be shed. Every Jewish household was commanded to get a lamb and to take it into their homes and take care of it for two weeks. Imagine that. Two weeks with an animal, you start getting attached. And then on the 14th day, they were commanded to kill it and smear the blood over the doorpost and and along the doorpost so that God would pass over their house when he come to judge the people. Can you imagine what it must have been like that night? Put yourself there. The lamb had been killed. You and your your family are sitting around uh, uh, the the dinner table. Blood was was on the doorpost. And no doubt the, the firstborn child is sitting there anxious. He's anxious. And he says to his father, Father, I haven't been good. Father, you know I've I've done a a, a lot of wrong things in my my life. I've made a lot of mistakes. Father, is the blood going to be enough? Is it going to be enough? Are you sure that's what God is seeking? My life is on the line tonight, Father. And I can imagine that faithful father looking to his son or his his daughter and saying the blood will be enough. The blood will be enough. And it was. Because the Bible says, as the Lord passed through the land that night, if he saw blood on your doorpost, he just passed right over your house. Judgment was passed over because of the blood. Because of the blood. And then there's the cross. On the cross we see Jesus, blood dripping down his face and his forehead, blood oozing from his hands and his feet, blood running down the back of his legs because of the scourging he took, blood gushing from his side, the Son of God shedding his own blood so that you could be forgiven. It's all about the blood. God has always demanded a blood sacrifice. But have you ever wondered why? I know I have. Why why the blood? Our sophisticated and, and modern minds think it's so primitive, so ancient, so archaic that God would require a blood sacrifice in order to be forgiven of sin. 
How foolish is that? Well, the Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And I think there's a number of reasons as to why God chose blood over everything else. First, I think the Lord chose blood to remind us of just how ugly sin is. When we see blood, we're repulsed. We're repulsed. We're disgusted. Some of us become nauseated and, and gag. We shrink from it. We draw back. And that's how God reacts to our sin. He's disgusted by it. He shrinks from it. Shrinks at its, at its very sight. See, as men and women, we, th we take sin lightly. Most people just wink at sin and, and don't give it a second thought, but not God. Not God. I think blood serves as a reminder to us of just how ugly sin is. Secondly, I think the Lord chose blood to remind us that the cost of our sin is high. The cost of sin is high. Our salvation didn't cost us anything, but it cost God everything. His only begotten Son. Blood is a reminder of the price that was paid. That is what we are reminded of every time we partake in communion. We are reminded of the price that was paid because of our sin. Thirdly, God chose blood because there's life in the blood. There's life in the blood. Blood supplies our physical bodies right now with oxygen and, and nutrients. It supplies our bodies with life. And not only does blood supply physical life, but it provides spiritual life as well. We're told in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's where our physical lives come from. But not only that, God says, I've given my blood to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. God chose blood because it is the source of both physical and spiritual life. And finally, God chose blood because it cleanses out all the impurities in our system. Cleanses out all the impurities. Within the context of our physical bodies, blood removes the waste. That's what it does. It removes waste. It removes the carbon dioxide and, and the lactic acid that is in our system. It removes all the bad things, all the contaminants. And that's the reason the Lord chose blood. It remo removes the impurity of sin from our souls. And many respond to the gospel message and, and the power of the blood by saying, How foolish! How foolish do you have to be to believe that? Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the blood of Christ is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. You either respond to God by saying there's power in the blood, or you respond by saying this is absolute and utter foolishness. And that's how Cain chose to respond to God and his request for a blood sacrifice. He responded in his heart by saying, how foolish is this? How foolish is this? I don't have time for this nonsense. I've lived a good life. I haven't bothered anybody. I don't need to be forgiven of sin. That's for the, the weak-minded. I'm a farmer. I've worked hard to raise these fruits and vegetables. I'm going to offer God something better. I'm going to offer Him the, from the work of my hands. That makes more sense, Cain says, than a blood sacrifice. A blood sacrifice is foolishness. I'm going to do it my way because my way is more logical. It makes more sense. It just seems right. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. This offering seemed right to Cain. And I think in my own heart that he was sincere when he offered this sacrifice. Unfortunately, he was sincerely wrong. He was sincerely wrong. 
And I think that's going to be the case for a lot of people as they stand before the Lord on the day of judgment. They're going to find out that they are sincerely wrong because they tried to offer God something other than what He was seeking. And we're told in Genesis that Cain responded to the Lord in rage and anger. Angry because his brother had found favor. Angry because God had rejected him and his offering. And look at how gracious and lovingly the Lord responds to Cain in the midst of his anger. The Lord says in in verse 7 of Genesis, If you will do what's right. He says, Cain, if you will do what's right, you too will be accepted. All you have to do, Cain, is, is do what's right. Do what I've asked you to do. Bring a blood sacrifice. And you too will be accepted. But if not, sin is crouching at the door, waiting to pounce on you, waiting to rule over you, waiting to condemn you. And we know from the Scriptures that Cain never did what was right. He never did what was asked of him, what was acceptable to God. And sin pounced on him when he hardened his heart. It ruled over him as he killed his brother. And it ultimately condemned him when the Lord drove him out of his presence. All because Cain refused to bring the sacrifice, the offering that God had asked for. This is what the Bible calls the way of Cain in the book of Jude. The way of Cain. The way of Cain is choosing a different way than that which God is seeking. But you don't have to go the way of Cain this morning. You can choose to go the way of Abel. And Abel probably didn't understand everything that I've explained to you about the blood this morning. How could he? He didn't have the revealed Word of God in his hands like we do. But by faith, by faith, he took God at his word and did what he was asked to do. He brought a blood sacrifice. And that's what made Abel's offering more excellent than Cain's. That's why Abel's offering was received and respected. Abel was committed, he was convinced, and he comprehended what God was asking. And that's faith. That's faith. By faith, Abel offered the appropriate sacrifice. And that's where faith begins. That's where faith begins for each one of us. It begins by offering God the appropriate sacrifice. So what is the appropriate sacrifice that God is seeking from us today? From each one of us this morning? Is He asking us to make a physical blood sacrifice? No. Jesus, the Lamb of God, has already made that sacrifice on our behalf. That's the beauty of the cross. We don't have to make the sacrifice ourselves. And the Bible says that God is asking us to, by faith, believe in Christ and the sacrifice that He made on Calvary's hill. That's all God's asking. That is all the, the, the only sacrifice that He will accept. That's the only sacrifice that God will receive and respect. Every other sacrifice will be rejected by God. There's only one thing that completely satisfies God. And that's the blood of Christ. Nothing else will satisfy Him. Nothing else will be accepted. Now, if you bring the appropriate sacrifice, God will not reject you like He did Cain. No, He will accept you like He did Abel. We're told in our text that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, by the which God testified to his righteousness. Because of his blood sacrifice, Abel became right in the the eyes of God. That is the power of childlike faith. It makes you right. It makes you righteous in the eyes of God. It brings you in right standing with the creator of the universe. And the same thing happens to us when we put our faith in the blood sacrifice of Jesus. 
Listen to what the blood of Jesus does for the believer. First, it redeems you this morning. It redeems you. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, You are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and without blemish. That word redeem means to buy back. To buy back. Jesus says in the Gospel of John that each of us are slaves to sin. So He went to the cross and shed His blood in order to buy us back, in order to buy us out of slavery. The blood of Christ redeems us. It buys us out of slavery this morning. The blood of Christ today justifies you. We're told in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, we are justified by His blood. Now what does that word justified mean? It means just as I never sinned. That's what it means. Just as I never sinned. Many of you this morning just want to be forgiven for your sins. But the blood of Christ will, will do one better. It will completely wipe away your sins. As if you never sinned at all. And God will look on you and He'll see no sin because you're covered in the blood of Christ. Thirdly, the blood of Christ brings peace this morning. We're told in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, that we, are, that we have made peace by the blood of Christ. We have made peace by the blood of Christ. We live in a world where everyone is seeking peace. And the only thing that can bring peace, true and everlasting peace, is the blood of Christ. Peace with yourself and peace with God. There's no other way than the blood of Jesus. And finally this morning, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. We're told in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of this earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from all our sins in his own blood. We have been washed, completely cleansed from all of our impurities, all the impurities of sin, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This is what the blood of Christ has done. And because it has done these things for you, you will be accepted by God. He deems you to be in right standing with Him. And just like he did for Abel, he will testify to your faith. He will testify to your faith. And God is still testifying today of Abel's faith this morning. Even though he's been dead for thousands and thousands of years, God is still testifying to this man's faith. And we're told at the end of our text today that even though Abel is dead, yet he still speaks. Abel is still speaking at this very moment because he put his faith in God thousands and thousands of years ago. And because of his faith, he will continue to speak for all of eternity. This morning, you must make one of two choices. One of two choices. You can go the way of Cain, your own way, and ultimately be rejected. Or you can go the way of Abel and put your faith in the blood of Christ and be accepted by God. Only two choices this morning. There's no neutrality with Christ. You must make one of two choices. What will your choice be? Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today. And Lord, we just thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. And Lord, I just pray for those out there that if they have not accepted that sacrifice by faith, Lord, that they will see the importance of it here this morning. Lord, that it is the only way that a man or woman can be accepted in the eyes of God. It's the only way we, we can become righteous. It's the only way God asks. And Father God, I just pray, Lord, if there'd be one that has not accepted you by faith, Lord, that today would be the day that they would do it. This is where faith begins. This is where faith begins. 
by accepting the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's hill. Lord, we thank you for that sacrifice. Lord, we thank you for what it means, Lord. We can't comprehend it all, Lord, as men and women. Lord, we just accept it by faith. That's all we can do. And that's all you will accept. Lord, we thank you for our time together here this morning. It is in Christ's name I pray. Amen.